Okay, welcome to Eric's Perspective. Uh, joining me today uh, is Halima Taha. I'm sitting in my gallery in Fullerton, California, and Halima is in her home in New York. So Halima, first of all, thank you so much for uh, joining us on this episode of Eric's Perspective. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you. Excellent. It's always good to see you, and it's been a little while. I'm glad to see you, even if it's only by uh, Zoom. This is fabulous. Yes. I think these days it's always good to be seen and to see people uh, um, six feet above the ground. Exactly. I mean, with this pandemic going on, it's just uh, uh, it's nice to have this as an alternative. So, Halima, I thought I would just get started by maybe just going back to the beginning, if you will, kind of. Um, I was just curious to know if you could let us all know, how is it that you became interested in the arts? Can you trace it back to the beginning? Well, I, I my interest in the literary, performing, and visual arts really began at home and also being raised in, in New York uh, City and having access to so many extraordinary museums and theater and um, visiting libraries on a regular basis. And my parents uh, were really committed to just making the city our playground and, in, and encouraging me and my two brothers to explore the world and so that we could learn new things about ourselves. And also, as you know, um, as parents, we, we want our children to explore things that they might have an interest in you know so um yes. so that's how it began and um and then uh i also was very interested in in uh the performing arts more so um because i was a dancer i originally was a dancer and i also was interested in becoming an attorney and i had these illusions of grandeur about dancing across the courtroom to give my summation <laughs> uh and I was very serious about that. And, um, but I also, you know, I took uh, sculpture classes and I had taken some art classes, but I had been discouraged early on uh, in terms of becoming a visual artist um, because unfortunately, when I was much younger, when I would, when we were supposed to do still lives, I would do the still lives, but my interest in, in the colors was that I wanted them to be more colorful than they actually were. And I had art teachers that um, dismissed the value of that and, um, and made me feel rather diminished in my efforts to be creative. Oh, no. So as a result, if I, if I, if I try to draw something or I paint, I, I, I literally freeze. <laughs> oh. um, but, uh, but later on, I, you know, I picked up the camera and I, on occasion, on and off, I, take photographs for my own pleasure and I enjoy that and um, but for the most part the visual arts um, were something that I always appreciated and I've always had friends who were musicians and I've always had friends who were visual artists as well as writers and so what and as of course um, dancers and um, actors as well but as a result all of those different creative sensibilities um, within those disciplines intersect yeah. And so uh, the opportunity to uh, immerse myself in the visual arts uh, really came um, after college. Uh, I had uh, had my first job after college at Children's Television Workshop, which I think now they call Sesame Place. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And uh, I was working there for a year and I just didn't understand why I had to sit in an office for eight hours when I could do the job in four. It just huh. was, it was just beyond me. So I decided that I wanted to um, leave the uh, somewhere, go somewhere. And uh, I pulled out a map and closed my eyes. And when I closed my eyes, I put my finger wherever it was going to be. And it turned out that it landed on out of the whole world Belgium. <laughs> Belgium. But, and I happened to have a very, very good and dear friend who was a accomplished sound engineer and disc jockey. Um, and uh, I spoke with him and I stayed, I, I you know, crashed with him in, in Brussels and, uh, and left, left my job and, and went to Europe. And while I was there, I had met a, um, 
an art dealer from Iran um, who sold art and who also did a, and also was a radio show host. And I had an opportunity to be exposed to um, quite a bit um, of work when I was there. And when I came back from that trip, I was hired to work at a gallery in Gramercy Park called the Onyx Art Gallery. Uh -huh. And at that point, I'm about 20, now I'm about 21. It was like, uh, maybe, yeah, I was about 21. And um, I was hired uh, there to, to um, manage the gallery. And I was introduced to that opportunity by the extraordinary photographer, uh, fine artist, painter, um, fashion photographer, Anthony Barbosa. Ah. And, um, and so when I started there, uh, I was working as manager there and there was a, another person who is also an internationally acclaimed photographer by the name of Frank Stewart, who was at the time the artistic director at the gallery. Uh -huh. And uh, we started working together and three months after uh, working there, I ended up becoming a partner because the original owner of the gallery decided that he wanted to close the gallery. Oh. Um, and he was from Switzerland. And, um, and Frank and I were extremely committed to uh, nurturing the development of black visual culture. And so the Onyx Gallery was actually the first gallery to specifically promote abstract works by American artists of African descent as the visual equivalent of the jazz idiom. Ah. And uh, we had um, many artists whom in the 1980s, whom 57th Street galleries were not interested in exhibiting. And a lot of that was once they walked in the door. I mean, many of the artists were told we don't show black art and they never looked at the work uh, they just saw the people and said, we don't show black art. And uh, we, had, we had photography shows. Um, we had 19th, 20th century work. Um, we had Joe Overstreet, um, Jack Whitten, Mary Lovelace O'Neill's uh, work. We had Terry Atkins' work, Adric Cowan's work, um, Chuck Stewart's work, um, Van Der Zee, Henry Osawa Tanner, David Driscoll, Lois Maylou Jones, um, Elizabeth Catlett, you know, Samela Lewis, Charles White. I mean, the list goes on. We, ha we had access and an inventory of all of this great work. And so that was the way that I, I actually immersed myself in the art world, but from the perspective of being an art dealer and an educator. Um, my contemporaries chronologically would be Dr. Kelly Jones and would be Thelma Golden. Mm -hmm. And so the three of us were engaged in the field, but with very different focuses. And, um, you know, Kelly Jones um, at that time was curating and uh, did the Venice Biennale, uh, you know, in the 80s, you know, and she, I mean, she's, she was writing and, and then she went on and has become, you know, an extraordinary scholar, um, but she has always been an extraordinary thinker. And, um, and so her focus was curating, writing, and of course, um, now she's a professor at Columbia University. And it's so, you know, her, her contribution to the field um, is quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, Thelma Golden's focus was on curating an institution building. And so she, of course, is the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem and by, you know, via the Whitney Museum as a curator. And um, so we all had very different focuses. My interest was in the marketplace, which was the area that many people were not focusing on because traditionally it was curating and writing, you know, art history right. and, or, and, um, and a lot of catalogs and there weren't a lot of books or information to help people understand uh, African-American visual culture within an art historical context um, uh, in the marketplace, I should say. Within the art historical context, of course, you know, the whole field of African-American art history, as you know, began with James Porter with his 1943 master's thesis and book, um, Modern Negro Art, mm -hmm. um, which was the first publication 
to uh, affirm that people of African descent in the United States did have a visual culture. And I don't know if you know how it came about for him to write this book. Do you know how he, that came about? Well, no. Why don't you uh, let us all know? <laughs> um, well, he was an artist himself, and he wanted to know why the artists from the Harlem Renaissance, uh, why did the artists from the Harlem Renaissance not receive any sort of critical acclaim? And the, he was told because Black people haven't been here long enough for there to be any sort of art criticism or consideration. So that was the catalyst for him to do uh, the research and to document that the fact that there has always been an existence of people of African descent who were making fine art. So that's how that publication emerged. And it was a book of necessity. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in real quick, though, at the same time, he was the uh, head of the art department at uh, Howard University. And I just know from uh, one example, I, I remember doing a little research on uh, Mildred uh, Thompson, I think it was, and uh, apparently he his other role was supporting these artists. It was just incredible the lengths to which he would go. Uh, he, here he is, he's an artist and an administrator, and as you just pointed out, the author of this book, but at the same time, he was literally going out of his way to help artists in some of the most essential and basic ways, too. Very supportive. Absolutely. It was a phenomenal he was very He was very supportive, and uh, he, he built the African-American Art History Department at Howard University, and, that whole, and the whole curriculum, and established the field. And continuing his legacy was one of his students, one of his many students, was uh, David Driscoll. Mm -hmm. And David Driscoll um, uh, emulated everything that uh, James Porter did. I mean, he was an artist, he was a curator, he was an arts administrator, he um, spearheaded um, arts departments, he was an archivist, he was a scholar, um, you know, he was, he became an ambassador, you know, for the, um, uh, for um, African American art. And so in the, in continuing the tradition of the work of James Porter, uh, in the in in the 19, mid 1970s, he decided to write a um, a catalog as well that accompanied a traveling exhibition um, called Two Centuries of Black American Art." And you're speaking and about David Driscoll, built, now, right? David Driscoll. Yes, David Driscoll. Yeah. He um, continued the tradition of of James Porter mm -hmm. and built on his work also out of necessity to not only say not only do we have a history here, but we've been here for 200 years. Yeah. And both he and James Porter were both visual artists as well as curators and, and historians and, and, um, and scholars. And they wore many, many hats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and in this field, it, so much of its growth and development has come out of a necessity. And continuing with that, Dr. Samela Lewis was the first, though, formally trained art historian and woman I think she received her doctorate in 1954. Mm -hmm. So when she did Art African American as an African American art history book from an art historian's perspective, a trained art historian's perspective, mm -hmm. that became the cornerstone for the field at, at large, the, those three seminal publications. Yes. And, um, and coming out of that um, trajectory, you know, you have the scholarship of Dr. Richard Powell, you have the scholarship of the, um, Dr. Tertobia Gen um, uh, Benjamin, you have the scholarship of Judith Wilson, you have the scholarship of, you know, Mary Schmidt Campbell, you have the scholarship of, I mean, there's just so many different scholars early on mm -hmm. um, that really helped to shape the um, the art historical canon for um, African American art, ushering it into the 20th century and creating a foundation and a springboard to bring us to now. And then because of that foundation, um, I and working in the gallery, I realized that there was a need for there to be a publication that would talk a little bit about the history, but also to really talk about not only do we have a history and have we been here, but the work that's been produced is valuable. And this is how you can acquire this valuable visual culture. Ah. So coming out of that legacy, 
uh, I was inspired to write Collecting African-American Art, works on paper and canvas, which um, was an outgrowth of working at the Onyx Gallery because there were, in 1980s, um, there was a lot of disposable income. Um, many collectors uh, had already acquired their homes and had their vacations and their wardrobes and their jewelry and their stuff and their tax and their stocks and their bonds and they had you know expendable income so they started collecting but a lot of them didn't know uh, how to really begin and they um, were trying to use carryover skills uh, not sensibilities about what an investment is for in in stocks and bonds to art. And so there was a woman who came into the gallery and she was so excited. She had acquired this Elizabeth Catlett print and she wanted to show it to me. And she says, oh, I got this for such a great price and I have to show it to you. I'm just so excited. And I was excited for her. Yeah, and of course. So she shows it to me and she says, yeah, I got it for a really good deal. It was $7,500 and this was 1980. Five, uh -huh. 86. That print today doesn't sell for more than uh, $4,700. So she overpaid. She overpaid. And for me, this was a travesty. And uh, I felt sick because everyone works hard for their money. Yeah. And to take advantage of a person who was eager to have an experience like acquiring their first piece of art um, and to be taken advantage of really sickened me. And I felt that um, something needed to be done. So that was the catalyst for me to develop a how-to and reference guide where there's information about the materials artists use, matting, framing, insurance, appraising, tax considerations, and then providing just a succinct history of African-Americans in painting, prints, and photography, as well as a nation nationwide directory. Yeah. Uh, so that people could be, my intention was I wanted to nurture the development of informed collectors. And I wanted to also help massage the art world of collectors and, and, and dealers in particular, so that clients could be more informed when they worked with them. Yeah. And that's how that all happened. So, and, so um, how, how long did it take uh, from the time you conceived it until the time it was actually published? Oh, um, it took, uh, that was what, 85, 95. It's like 13, it was almost like 13 years, maybe. And what and was the reason for that? Years, it took eight years to try to sell the book to um, any of the major art publishers. And what happened is that the responses and the rejections revolved around three answers. Black people don't read. Oh, no. They don't buy art. And white people don't buy art by black people. Hmm. And they, would, they were willing to publish the book, but do it the way they had traditionally been doing it, um, with, with black institutions, like, you know, this, the famous uh, Harlem Renaissance exhibition at the Studio Museum that yeah. took place. Uh -huh. um, the Studio Museum had to uh, underwrite all the costs for the research and everything to produce it. Right. And then um, the publisher just stuck their name, the imprint on the spine of the book and handled the distribution contract. Oh, wow. But they weren't willing to invest in it as I you see. would get in advance. And this was the way that things were done. So I was told, well, you have to have an exhibition uh, because the book will not sell. Hmm. And so I am the kind of person where no or impossible. Uh, it, it's more about impossible. It just doesn't compute. I, I don't understand what that means. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that's partly because I um, think in terms of tangible and ephemeral manifestations. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that's another story. Yeah. So I realized that what I had to do was I had to provide some uh, concrete data and information um, that did not exist. And in doing so, um, I... Uh, had con you know and i just want to backtrack 
when this book was being written and when it was released, there were only like five African-American art history books available. And hundreds and hundreds and thousands, you know, thousands and thousands of catalogs. Um, whereas now, um, in 2021, we have hundreds of, of various perspectives on not only African American art history, but different um, periods and genres and, and um, sensibilities and meanings, which is very exciting. Yeah, yeah, and I want to explore that a little bit later too, by the way. But, okay. But uh... so, so the thing is, is that I I contacted all I contacted the um, art magazines, and I contacted all of the. Um, publications that were targeting African Americans, Black Enterprise, Emerge, Ebony, Essence, you know, all of those magazines, Legacy. And I called them and I said, listen, I am interested in advertising in your publication. Could you please um, send me your advertising demographics so I can see if this is a match? Mm -hmm. So this gave me concrete data about target audiences. Ah. And then I did the same with the, you know, art news, art in America, et cetera, because yeah. I had to dispel the misconceptions and disprove those three points of why publishers were not interested in this pub in, in my book. Yeah. And so, and then I called the Metropolitan um, Museum of Art. And at that time they had a Bill Trailer exhibition. Uh-huh. And they published a hard copy and a soft cover catalog to accompany it. So when I called, I, I um, decided to utilize my acting skills. <laughs> <laughs> and I called and I said that I was an editor at a publishing house considering the acquisition of its title. And I was curious how many um, catalogs they had published about Bill Trailer. And they told me that they had published something like uh, 3,000 and half of them were hardcover and half of them were softcover. And the show's only been open for three weeks and they've sold out all the hardcover um, copies. And, um, and then I asked them about their demographics, you know, um, how many people of European descent have seen this exhibition? Because if you ever go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, everybody, all of the guards and everyone that's there, they have clickers in their hand mm -hmm. and they're clicking the number of people that are coming into that exhibition. But they also can click other data, other kinds of information, one or two or this or that to let you know. So they have statistics to tell me how many people of European descent went to see the Bale Trailer show of an artist of African descent. Okay. And it was um, something like uh, 40, 47 point eight or nine percent so now i could dispel the other claim that you know people aren't even interested in works by african american right. artists whether it, right. whether it's whether it you know whether it's of any artist and so um and so i put all this data together in a marketing plan that was about 19 pages on and i faxed it over with other statistics and information and um and remember those clay coat, the clay coated fax paper? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so that's what I was using. Yeah. And um, and then the um, the acquisitions editor uh, read the proposal and she liked what was there as well as the marketing data, which helped her to sell it to her team. And, and the Crown Publishing ended up um, acquiring the book. And that was just step one of the process because there's still a lot of education within the publishing industry mm -hmm. um, about the market. And there were a lot of trials and challenges, um, even in terms of the cover selection and what they perceived would be appropriate and everything. But the bottom line is that the, the good news is that it was released in 1998 yeah. and it became the first book to validate collecting paper, prints, and photography by American artists of African descent as viable assets and commodities. And how, how, what was the response from the, not, not so much the publishers, but now what was the response from the consuming public? How, how well did it? Uh, it go? was, it was overwhelming. Um, it went, um, it went into uh, a, 
reprint, first reprint, a month and a half after it was released. Wow. Part of the reason behind that was that I was working with Absolute in conjunction with their art campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was lecturing around the country in conjunction with their Absolute Expressions campaign, which was focused on the Absolute campaign in which it was comprised of African-American artists. And so Absolute decided to purchase 500 copies of the book and fly them from China to the United States before the books actually entered the country. Wow. And, uh, and then at the last leg of the tour in Los Angeles, I did a presentation on collecting African-American art and these were corporate giveaways uh, for whomever attended. And the people who came received the first copies uh, weeks before the, uh, the the rest of the books arrived in the country. And, you know, for an art book and an art book about African-American art artists and collecting them, uh, the first print run was 7,500 copies, which was astounding because usually at that time, maybe 3,000 or 3,500 would be an appropriate uh, press run. Right. And Once everyone received the copies, apparently everybody was calling everyone around the country and there were all of these pre-orders that were being made. So when the books finally arrived, uh, within within two weeks, there were only 358 copies left. So they had to go into a reprint. And it's gone into six reprints since. Oh, that's fantastic. This is before Instagram. No, of course. (laughs) Or, you know, yeah. Facebook, the way it's right. all the social media. Right. right. You're describing um, a word of mouth campaign in this typical grassroots manner, it sounds like. Yeah. And, and you know, and then, you know, there was some other press. PBS used it as a membership in, uh, a membership incentive, and they earned three and a half times their membership uh, goal yeah. um, with it. And so, I mean, it, the publication has done what I wanted it to do, which yeah. was to nurture the development of informed collectors, massage the market, and allow people to have a good time in discovering new and exciting things about themselves through art. And that's really what I wanted. And mostly not be taken advantage of by, you know, mercenary people. Well, that's the thing. I think a lot of of fear of collectors in general is just that, that uh, am I spending too much, I think is one, one of the things that I think every collector, regardless of experience in collecting, kind of confronts um so that was one of the things that you addressed in this book to to kind of give people tips on how not to be taken advantage of for example i would think also kind of connected to that would be authenticity and and all those kinds of other issues right and so obviously those were the kinds of things you were addressing in addition to the african-american aesthetic right absolutely i didn't go so much into the concept of the african-american aesthetic in terms of art um, because the whole concept of a African American or a Black aesthetic and art really comes from a literary perspective that W. E. B. Du Bois um, started. He opened up a discourse about it, and the only people that primarily responded to it were really um, uh, writers, mm-hmm. um, visual artists, um, uh, African American visual artists. Did not really respond to that discourse with him. Yeah. Why do you think that was the case? You know, in, in you know, the, in some ways, I think you know he had you know he had his idea of the talent to ten, and he had his, a certain kind of elitist view. I mean, he was very vocal against uh, D. W. Smith's Birth of a Nation, and how abhorrent those images of black people were. But at the same time, he was not a fan of someone like uh, Palmer Hayden or um, Archibald Motley. He didn't like the way that they depicted black people. Right. And they were very popular at, in, you know, at a certain you know, period of time as well. And, and he, you know, they, that did not support his vision of what black people should be or look like. It perpetuated um, other views. So he decided to shift his folk on a black aesthetic to, about, to it being about music. Ah. And so that's why um, there, you know, there's there. It's either about literature or it's about music more than the vis- the visual, um, the visual arts. And so when people talk about the black aesthetic in terms of visual arts, it's it uh, historically using Du Bois as the base of you know as the springboard of that discourse. Right. Um, there's a lot of different issues now um, in the '60s. Um, the real um, uh, 
beginning of a discussion about a black aesthetic really had a lot to do with Chicago's wall of respect and, and, and a bossy. But unfortunately, it was the beginning of a conversation and it wasn't really about the black aesthetic. It was about the beauty of black culture. And when they ha invited artists to participate, for whatever reason, the artists did not choose to include any of the historic visual artists like Henry Osawa Tanner, you know, oh, or, yeah. or, or Pippin or Jacob Lawrence or even, you know, Bearden. So when you look at that beautiful wall of respect, you have all of these um, writers and and um, and uh, scholars and 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 people like that. Um, Alain Locke, during the Harlem Renaissance, though, prior to Du Bois, did begin to talk about a black aesthetic, and his, but within the context of um, drawing upon your own historic and ancestral past. You know, uh, more. You know, don't right. just follow the Eurocentric Academy. Um, and I think for all visual artists, the palette is the sum of their experiences, the things that they're exposed to and how they're going to push the medium. But it wasn't until Afro Cobra came to be shortly after Obasi, um, where they really talked about what an, a black aesthetic was and it had a, a function and a purpose um, for that, um, that upheld um, black people and their culture and their heritage. So the color palette for the paintings was very much an aesthetic using these bright Kool-Aid colors. And you were not allowed to use the pigments of white. <laughs> right. At, because they wanted to diminish the value of white right. in a world that diminished the value of black. So you could mix white and create pink if you wanted, but you could not have white as a value. It was a, it was a way of just removing that as a value, um, which is, you know, um, perpetuated in the concepts of, well, if it's good, then it's white. If it's black, you know, bad, it's black, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and so, but also there was a, a drive for optimism and hope and, 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 and beauty um, uh, within. So that's where a beginning of a real conscious, um, aesthetic and social political um, vision for a um, uh, theoretical um, aesthetic mm -hmm. for black visual culture really, I think, began. Well, uh, another thing I wanted to touch on is that uh, this idea about abstract art. In the very beginning, you were mentioning, you were featuring in Onyx Gallery abstract art as a kind of a visual, uh, I'm paraphrasing now, a visual equivalent of kind of like jazz. Uh, and I noticed on the cover, at least of the early copies of uh, Collecting African American Art you did, is the Richard Mayhew piece that is somewhat abstract anyway. And I was just curious yeah. if you could comment on this idea. I like the, the analogy. I used to actually, in some of my art appreciation classes, draw the same analogy. Some folks really couldn't, uh, I, I, I noticed that a lot of folks couldn't really connect with abstract visual art. But they love John Coltrane and, and Miles Davis. And, and it's, I was trying to say, you know, it just try to imagine you know, Miles and, uh, and John Coltrane as, as visual. And uh, what you have is like an abstraction. So anyway, can you just comment on this whole idea about uh, collecting sure. abstract art? Sure. So um, the way that the cover of, of collecting African-American art came about was that um, in my mind, I wanted to, um, I, I didn't want the viewer to come with an, a specific idea of what the aesthetic range or a limitation depending on the viewer's perspective of the work of American artists of African descent would be. Um, it's not all figurative. It's not, you know, it, and, I, and I just wanted it to just be colorful and engaging. And, um, and the publishers at the time, uh, they wanted to put a mammy on the cover. Um, well, that was one, one cover they were considering. Um, another cover was they were tearing up the pieces of the paintings of all of the artists that were in the work and having their uh, art, their cover art designer to do a collage, you know, oh, I mean, just, yeah, it was, it was, it was quite an um, adventure. So <laughs> I, um, I actually um, had to fight for the cover. And I, you know, was told, well, you know, you're a first time author, um, 
you don't know what you're talking about. I'm saying, no, I, I own the gallery and I know the market, but I have more information for you. There are certain colors based on a Japanese study that have to do with um, retail merchandising display and that this Japanese study um, says that certain colors, people are t tend to pull things off of the shelves. Mm. And I wanted something that was engaging and beautiful and also something that from a, uh, in terms of marketing, um, uh, uh, so, you know, gestalt in terms of the eye and the central, the sensorial relationship that would make people want to pull this off the shelf, no matter what their cultural heritage was. Yeah. And so I had to substantiate that. And I picked Richard Mayhew because number one, he's an incredible painter and, um, you know, colorist and landscape. Um, he's known, you know, for these brilliant landscapes. And, um, and, and, the, and the work just, it, it just worked for the cover, mm -hmm. but that, you know, that's pretty much how that was, um, how that came about um, in, in selecting his work. Um, back to jazz and abstract works, um, you know, a lot of people wouldn't talk about African-American artists uh, in, in relation to, uh, in, in relation to uh, visual of being the visual equivalent of of, um, of jazz, you know, this is the same culture, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, that produced, you know, Armstrong and Coltrane and Thelonious Monk and Charlie Parker and, you know, uh, Billie Holiday, um, uh, Prez, you know, all of them, you know, it's just, right. it's, so why not? And the abstract work, um, also comes from a tradition that also comes, you know, straight from, you know, Africa. All of these, there are certain abstract concepts um, aesthetically that's not just in sculpture, but in pattern and design. And of course, you know, Picasso, you know, learned a lot from it and yeah, took it. Right. And you have Cubism, and and um, and he also took a lot from Wilfred Alam, you know. So. Um, which are all um, a part of a very diverse African aesthetic on a huge continent. So, um, but I think that uh, the issue with regard to abstract artists of African descent um, in terms of how people perceive the ability for these artists to work abstractly with very complex ideas within the use of the media has a lot to do with the historic limitations that have been projected upon artists of African descent, which continue to perpetuate the idea that uh, the fine arts, the plastic arts uh, is, is an intellectual art form. It, it's about ideas. Mm -hmm. And how can the same people who we've enslaved because we say that they're subhuman and unintelligent and only good for, for breeding and labor, how could they even conceive right. of any of these complex ideas? But then of course they forget about music and what the, and the complexity of polyrhythms in music, right. or they, they forget the culinary arts and the complexity of different flavors in different kinds of, of cooking and, and everything. And they, they forget um, a lot of the um, uh, duality and multiplicity of ideas and um, mediums and textures that are an integral part of um, African diasporic culture at large. So uh, the people who are the critics have had a hard time looking at the work as meritorious work and even figurative work too, um, when uh, the artist's skill and ability um, exceeded their expectations, there's been an investment in diminishing the value. But that has changed. I mean, um, it's changed to a certain extent um, now as the market has um, uh, developed. And I'm very excited about that because you know I was waiting to see what would happen um, after the release of the, of the first book and how much time it would take for the market to catch up. And I do want to say, Eric, you know, um, we have to document 
and give credit also, not only to the historians that we've talked about, and not only to the collectors that have really helped develop the market before this recent boom or interest, but we really have to talk about Josh Wainwright and the National Black Fine Art Show, because oh, yeah. that was the first, as you know, and you did that show, yeah. that was the first um, uh, uh, fine art show dedicated to artists of African descent, where people had an opportunity under one roof to experience national and regional and global um, uh, talent of artists of African descent. And, um, and that marketplace from 1997 to 2008 at the Puck Building on Lafayette in Manhattan um, really cultivated the market. And it cultivated it to the point that between that show and the educational programs that I also did with Josh and the release of my book, um, that's what helped develop and cultivate the market and also the decided risk to create Swan Auction Galleries as the first, to have the first African-American auction category. Right. It's funny you mentioned that because I can recall uh, when it began, uh, they were advertising in the National Black Fine Art Show, Show catalog. And so that was one way to attract the buyers. And as you said, the Josh did a wonderful thing. I'm, I actually missed participating in that. That was one of my favorite things to look forward to every February, late January, is to uh, to go to New York City and participate in that. Yeah. Thing. Because there was an education. And I look forward to seeing you on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, see, that's right. And my daughter actually went to NYU, so it was uh, for a I while. I remember. For a while there, I was uh, able to see her at the same time, which was like a double bonus. But uh, you're right. I think that that had a tremendous impact on the formation. A of huge the, impact. Yeah. And, and these, this is not something that people, you know, th this is one of the things that concerns me is that there are a lot of us who are out here who are very passionate and we're, we're cultural workers. You know, we're, we, we love what we do. And um, it's not about, you know, having followers and being an influencer. It's not about getting press. It's about doing the work that's needed to be done. Yeah. And there has not been much discussion about the impact of that show. And I have to say that what it took for him to do that show, people would never really know the, the, you know, what it took, the kinds of risks and, um, and, you know, and a lot of pushback within the, you know, the art field itself, and even the, the, the criticism of the show and, um, and, but his, his doing that um, was in, in his leadership, um, Loris Crawford, who uh, also had a gallery and participated, she developed the, I think it was off the main, the Caribbean art fair. Mm -hmm. um, because of that, and um, and then uh, now we have Micaia, uh, Michaela Solomon um, in uh, Miami, who who does the Prism Art Fair mm -hmm. um, at, during uh, Art Basel, and you know he is he he created um, a standard um, that did not exist before, and um, and it's very important. It's, 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 it's very important because whenever you do something for the first time, I can tell you from my own experience, um, every, everybody wants to say it's impossible. Right. And you can't do it. Right. And it's not that it's not worth it. Um, but, you know, he had a vision and he was able to, you know, implement it. And it's just, it's just unfortunate that shortly thereafter the market had crashed and it, it um, didn't well, enable it to continue. Well, not only that, I also remember that uh, Puck Buildings shifted ownership and, uh, and I, I think he wasn't able to hold it there. I think the last one was held, as I recall, at a building near the Empire State Building or something like that. Right, right. They they sold it, and then the big difference, I think, was that the exorbitant um, union expenses right. in that other location um, in, that that had to be, you know, made it and just it just made it right. impossible. Difficult. You know? By the way, whatever happened to the Onyx Gallery? So the Onyx Gallery um, uh, closed. Originally, it was set up as an experiment to ascertain whether or not there was a market for a gallery that exclusively promoted African-American artists. And, um, and so, I, it, I, we, you know, we, uh, you know uh, Frank and I closed the gallery 
Um, I was consulting with um, a couple of auction houses and other um, arts organizations and um, uh, working as an art advisor. Um, and, um, and I went back to grad school and, and everything. Um, so we closed the gallery. Uh -huh. um, and uh, and I started working on you know the the book and everything else that I was doing, um, but the the gallery did very well. I, I was going to I was going to ask you, looking back on it, would you consider it? You you mentioned that it was kind of like an experiment, and I was just wondering what you thought the results. So overall, would you say it was a success? Yes, overall it was a success. I mean, we had um, we also. Um, uh, had full page color ads in the eighties in art news, art in America, um, and the art forum. Mm -hmm. And we, we received, um, reviews, uh, for some of the shows that we had rather quickly because, you, you know, for an, a fairly young gallery, you know, it takes a while sometimes to get critics in the doors, as you probably know oh, as from, well. ex from experience. Let me tell you, yeah, it, that's like, uh, so we, we, it, yeah. We did. We had a lot of success in that regard. Most of our clients, um, you know, when we talk, you know, most of our clients were coming from Europe and Japan at that time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the European clients that were interested in the work were huge collectors of German expressionism. Mm. And they were very, very moved and very interested in the abstract works of American artists of African descent. They saw a... A, a very direct and profound connection. And at the same time, um, there was um, uh, the way, just the range of the palette and the movement in these pieces. Uh, and also their, of course, their love for jazz music sure. um, really uh, resonated. And then in the eighties, of course, the Japanese were, you know, buying everything, <laughs> right, right. you know, everything. Yeah. And, so they, 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 they started, um, you know, they were also our clients. Um, and then we had, a, you know, we had, we had, a, you know, clients from all over, you know, uh, the country, but um, a big part of it that I thought was wonderful was the educational component yeah. um, of working with clients and helping them develop confidence. And um, so, so that they could make decisions and, um, and, and, and enjoy um experience and and uh, have pieces that grew as they grew yeah them. yeah so that's i wanted to shift gears to the present day i just wanted to get your take on as you mentioned before there's so many more books now that have been published for example there's been exhibits at various uh so-called mainstream museums around the country and uh, soul of a nation travel started in england and went all over the u.s and so on that's on one side and then on the other side you got Record setting auction prices like that six million, whatever, for the um, Jacob Lawrence piece not too long ago, and some other uh, record setting um, right. auction prices. So, what's your take on this sort of development in the field of African American art? Okay, well, I think that right now, um, uh, one of the reasons why I feel that there's been this increased interest and particularly works by artists who were working in the 1960s and 70s uh, is that that generation of artists um, parallel the generation of all those middle-aged white men that art, the art world was um, support, you know, nurturing, supporting and upholding as being the giants of, of the art world from the mid 20th century to the end of the century and coming into the beginning of this century. So they're, they're either deceased or the best of their work has already been collected or um, there just isn't any more. So how do you maintain that value in a country that is um, becoming predominantly brown and black? And the question is, how do you uh, continue to sustain an interest in um, in the business of museums? Mm -hmm. You know, how are you going to continue to keep the doors open? And and so I think that's what's been happening as what was happening earlier in the 80s and the 90s by serious collectors of American art is that these institutions have been filling the historic and aesthetic gaps in their American art collections with the contemporaries of those artists that they upheld. And so, and most of these artists are now dying, dead, 
um, or, um, you know, are being discovered. So, um, and they're now in their 80s or their, you know, mid 60s or their late 70s. So I think that that's, that's part of it. And the other thing has to do with the fact that now the curatorial themes, there's a couple of variables, the curatorial themes are impact the interest, um, the what's happening in Africa, Europe, the United States, what globalism has to do with the marketplace, as well as transnationalism, you know, and, um, you know, and the internet. I mean, these are, these are some of the things, I mean, the that are contributing to the interest. So for instance, when you think of curatorial themes from throughout the African diaspora in the marketplace, we're looking at work that's that's addressing identity and the fashioning of new subjectivities. We're looking at colonial legacies, especially with a lot of the contemporary African artwork. We're looking at uh, social issues, black consciousness. Um, we're looking at geography, space, place. We're looking at post-independence and democracy and um, attaining freedom from the strictures of gender, race, and history. Mm -hmm. And I think the other themes include art-specific subjects and aesthetic movements. And those are the things that are appealing to a broad and diverse group of people in terms of aesthetics. And because of the history of colonialism and travel and, um, uh, marriage and life and, you know, you have, you know, artists of African descent draw upon a diverse range of influences that come from uh, North, South, Central America, Europe, Asia, Africa, um, you know, all over the world. And people are living in these countries and, um, uh, and becoming a part of the, the, the national discourse of those countries and retaining their own cultural heritage and it's all mixed together. So as a result, um, you'll see some very uh, significant themes that are similar mm -hmm. and you'll also um, see different sensibilities. I mean, I, you know, I see it when I go to some of these art fairs and the, um, the uh, black British sensibility is one thing. The African American sensibility is something else. Caribbean sensibility, but Caribbean who have been people from the Caribbean raised in Europe versus in the America, similar and different sensibilities. Um, uh, Afro Asian artists, um, uh, um, Afro European artists. Um, you know, just all over the world. There's a there's a thread because of the African diaspora, but the approach to the the work and the kinds of uh, narratives are distinct to those different geographies mm -hmm. and also most of the places outside the united states and the people are much more sophisticated in considering um, a plethora of ideas that and approaches to art making and a certain kind of freedom that does not exist in the united states so in many ways some of that art i personally think is a lot more exciting because the post-colonial conditioned responses to self and value and purpose um, is a very different experience for um, people in the united states and the impact of being enslaved here as compared to other places where people were able, they historically were enslaved, but they were still educated. Whereas in the United States, you know, that whole history of education and exposure and all of the um, awful things, um, although they occurred around the world, um, the psychological trauma, the epigenetic trauma that continues to um, be a part of the narratives in artists of African descent's work, um, in some ways, um, you know, is, has limited um, the aesthetic palette for some, except for those who really are able to push themselves further. Even the contemporary artists today that are working today. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I mean, there are exceptions. You know, there there are exceptions. You know, um, I think that um, one of my favorite exceptions is the Astor Gates. I think one of my favorite exceptions is um, uh, Mark Bradford. I think one of my favorite exceptions is, I mean, there's, 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 there's a few. There's I, mean, a I don't like, I personally don't like to give laundry lists of, of names. And I, and I say this because, um, because of the book, 
um, people always say, well, you know, who are the artists, you know, that, that you think, and, I, and I, I don't, I generally don't like to do that because I really want people to do the work. Look, right. have a dialogue with yourself. Think about it right. instead of going through a laundry list because you're doing, you know, collectors, as you know, are doing a disservice to themselves if right. they just want to go down the laundry list. But I'm, I'm talking about artists that are really thinking about things. Um, the issue with a lot of the contemporary artists that I find rather disappointing is that whether they have awards or not, um, there's a lot of uh, sampling and repurposing of other people's work uh. and making it their own um, and not including the fact that these other artists have been an influence in their art making I see. and acting as if their ideas just they just woke up and this is what they came up with i see that's kind of sounds and, like a sounds like a borderline plagiarism thing there <laughs> well yeah yeah yes and no yeah i mean you can borrow but you know when i think about when you when i you know having had conversations with artists in my 20s and my 30s and in my 40s you know who were older than i yeah. um they would always talk about what it was about that other artist that inspired them and what they got from them, but then how they push the medium forward. Right. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, like even like somebody like Kerry James Marshall, I mean, he talks about the influence and the impact of someone like Charles White. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But people who are younger than he, he and than he is and other, they don't really talk about that where you look at their work and you say, Oh my goodness, this person was heavily influenced by Mary Lovelace O'Neill or, Al Loving, you know, yeah. or, you know, right. and, but they never mention those artists. It's, it's, it, it and, and also um, the other thing is that the artists before they, when they socialize, they engaged in uh, vigorous discourse about aesthetics and art, as well as politics and life. And this really um, was the catalyst for the, for the creation of different movements. I mean, there wouldn't have been a movement like the spiral movement if the artists didn't come together. Now, a lot of the contemporary younger artists, they're, they're, they're afraid, they don't allow anybody or many people to come into their studios because right. they're afraid someone will take a picture and then right. post it and they won't get the credit. And then my question is, is that your only idea? Right. Or they just want you to introduce them to places and people so that they can get a show. And then if, if when I ask, oh, well, that's all well and good, but let, let me ask you, what's happening in your studio? Like, what are you working on? Right. You know, well, I, you know, I, they want to get a show. They want to book the gig, so to speak. Right, right, right. <laughs> and then they want to work towards the gig. And anyone that knows about creative process understands that process is exactly that. And yeah. so a lot of the work is, um, some of it is being created in a sort of cookie cutter mentality yeah contrived um, basically it's contrived yeah and they're also um following the artists that have been stamped uh approved you know usd grade a <laughs> approved by the art market right. and so they're 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 just going over and over this stuff in a way that is just um i don't know it's it's, it's very um disturbing to me and I'm, I'm concerned for the future of any innovative work and any um uh special types of movements uh that could happen uh aesthetically or even intellectually and i'm not saying it's not happening mm -hmm. but the people that are being champions are not necessarily advocating it's it's sort of like you know eric when you go and you you go to lecture and or you go to a panel discussion and you walk in and you listen and you leave and you feel sated because what you heard was a catalyst for a new idea or a possibility that you hadn't considered or you you learned something new. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not consistently happening with any of these panels uh, or even some of these podcasts necessarily, you know, right. people you feel like, oh, that's two hours. It's like going to a bad new movie. It's like, oh, okay, well, that was nice. But it's like two hours that I just will never get back in my life because people are patting each other on the shoulder. And, you know, and then when people ask specific questions, they, they don't at, answer directly or they can't honestly say, you know, I hadn't thought about that before. Or, you know, I don't know. I have to look into that. Right. And 
I think that that's the part about the shift now that um that I see among art professionals and um, and artists, you know, that are out and about that it's it, there's a lack of substance in 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 some of the discourse. I get you it. know. Well, I want to. We're running short on time, so before we end this, though, I do want to ask you uh, to impart on our listeners and viewers uh, any advice uh, on collecting. Would you have some general things that you could, you could suggest to folks out there who are either beginning or even if they're more seasoned collectors that uh, you would uh, caution them against or urge them to do? I think one of the things that I think is important is for um, new and seasoned collectors is to start to um, read you know, and to create a library because most art collectors simultaneously become bibliophiles. Mm -hmm. And you do not have to start from the beginning of the book. Open the book in a chapter that you're actually interested in and read from that point on uh, because uh, you will ultimately read the whole book. But I think that it's important to start wherever you're interested, wherever you're interested. And also to keep abreast of what's being written in magazines, go to museums and galleries, look at art, um, ask yourself what it is that you like about the work, what is it that you don't like about the work, um, and so that you begin to get a sense of what types of work that you appreciate. Um, be confident in your own opinion about, about the work. Um, uh, don't keep up with the Joneses in terms of, well, just because somebody else is collecting it and says that it's important and you don't like it, but you're going to, don't do that. Um, I think it's important to also uh, ask questions and understand that there, uh, being an informed collector, it helps you to be able to relax and enjoy the experience of what you are looking at. Being informed just means learn about the different materials that artists are using so that you can start to tell the difference between multiple originals and like prints um, or one of a kind originals um, like paintings and, and um, what additions mean and don't mean uh, sizes. Um, and uh, when you're working with different types of art professionals, be mindful that you know working with a dealer that has a brick and mortar gallery and also does art fairs. Some do art fairs and don't have brick and mortar galleries. It doesn't matter that you you if you're if you let them know what you're interested in or what your taste is uh, or or movement or people or just aesthetic, that helps them to serve you best. You don't if you only like figurative work. Um, it, it, it doesn't serve you if that if you're not clear about the kinds of things that you like for a dealer to spend time showing you abstract work that you may be interested in. But um, and expect the dealers to help educate you, but also be respectful of dealers to know that of their time because they don't get compensated for their time unless you acquire a piece of work. Whereas if you're working with an art um, consultant, an art consultant, um, you know, will usually get compensated also like a dealer at the time of the sale. Um, but if you're working with an art advisor, that person is almost like your personal curator. So you're paying them maybe a monthly retainer and then there's a certain percentage of the budget of what you spent that they, they earn. And the reason for that is that they extend the professional discounts that, that if a dealer says, okay, um, I'm giving you 20% off, which would normally be how a consultant would make their money, that they extend the professional discount to the client because they're being compensated already. Mm -hmm. um, working with more than one dealer is important because you're going to have access to more work. And also you wanna make sure that you're not building um, the aesthetic world, the aesthetic view of, of and taste of that dealer. All the dealers are different. They have different sensibilities, interests. And at the same time, you start learning about things. Don't get caught up in, um, uh, the gossip of anything, you know, you know, among dealers, because um, some dealers work very well together, some don't. Um, you're you're there to learn about the art and to get what you are interested in. Um, but if you work well with a dealer, um, and you really trust that one dealer, and you really don't want to work with other dealers, but you're traveling and you see something in another dealer's gallery, then call 
the dealer, you know? So I'm working with you, right, Eric? You're, let's say you're my dealer and I don't really feel comfortable or trust someone else. I have a good relationship with you. Well, then I would say, Eric, listen, I was, you know, in, in uh, Louisiana or Texas or I was wherever. And I saw this piece by such and such an artist at this gallery. Um, could you look into that for me? That does not mean that the piece is going to cost more because you didn't go directly to the dealer. Right. What that does do is it allows the dealer to vet it and, and serve you and you will still be you know, paying whatever the fair market value is, but you have the confidence of the trust of the deal that you're comfortable with. And a lot of times collectors don't realize that they can do that. Right. Thank you so much. And real quick, though, before we go, uh, is there another book in the offing or uh, what else is on the uh, on the docket? Are you are you going to be doing any uh, lecturing around? Of course, with the pandemic, I, that, that could be limited. I understand. But uh, what, what's going on with you? So, you know, I, I, I am doing different kinds of talks, of course, uh, with <laughs> uh, remotely, but um, hopefully soon I'll get back on the road um, with different um corporate and academic um, and civic group types of uh, lectures and tours. As far as another book, um, I have deliberately waited um, 20 years, although I've been following the market and taking notes and everything uh, to work on a new book, which I've been working on now um, very diligently for the last uh, couple of years. And this next book is about the marketplace, but from a global perspective. And um, I've been traveling prior to the pandemic to um, different art fairs around the world. And I'm looking at African uh, diasporic visual culture and the marketplace. And it, I'm working on another um, how-to um, book like the first one, but it's using that as a springboard and it's gonna be a lot more expansive in terms of the mediums that are included. Fantastic. And it will not have uh, uh, history chapters because there are now plenty of those books, right. but it will have some very, very um, uh, important, innovative and um, thought provoking information that will be of service to um, neophyte and seasoned collectors, and also as a really good tool for arts professionals um, all over the world. Well, we'll so I'm very excited about this. I am too, <laughs> hearing about it. I can't wait. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. And if anybody out there wants to, uh, do you have like, um, I don't know, a website or, or a handle or anything well, you, know, you want people to follow you on or what? Well, right now they can follow me on Instagram, um, Halima Taha Pro Arts with an S at the end. And um, that's, the, that's the best place to try to reach me at this point. Excellent. Um, and uh, I generally post work that I'm seeing uh, just, you know, from all over. And uh, that's, that's, you know, interesting to me and to others, but um, that would be the best place. And, Excellent. Um, Excellent. Thank you. So much, Eric. Oh, are you really, kidding me? Thank so you. Much fun. Thank you. And I'm excited as I know my listeners and viewers will be too for, for everything that you're up to, including the book. I'm very anxious to see how that come, turns out. Um, I want to thank you so much for sharing your perspective today. And thank you to all you viewers and listeners for tuning in. And please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Uh -huh.